Thanks for listening to Star Lores. If you like the show, please consider subscribing and giving a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help us make more great content by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com. We would also love to hear from you on social media. You can follow Star Lores on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Enjoy the show, and may the Force be with you. You are listening to the Star Lores Podcast. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Why you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? But I was going into Tashi Station to pick up some power converters. I love democracy. I love the Republic. There was a... There was a guy named von Clausewitz who said that war is a continuation of politics by other means. Politics has always been a vital part of the Star Wars mythos. Peace and war are often defined on religious or political grounds. The galaxy's innumerable conflicts are intertwined with political motivations, as they are with the will of powerful individuals. George Lucas intentionally wrote elements of Star Wars to reflect the political milieu of his time. The Vietnam War had just ended when A New Hope was released. The United States was in the middle of a drastic social change as society shifted from the attitudes of the 1960s towards the 1970s. Each iteration of Star Wars reflects elements of the political atmosphere of its times, with a prequel trilogy addressing the political climate of the early 2000s, and as does the modern iterations of the Disney era, as clumsy and ham-fisted as they may be. For better or ill, the prequels spend an inordinate amount of time on the minutia of galactic politics and the function of government. The expanded universe with its assortment of writers and creatives is also rife with cultural, political, and historical themes and narratives that adds a multi-dimensional view of the Star Wars universe as a whole. A space opera titled Star Wars must address the political impetus for the wars waged within its narrative borders. This will be a real-world analysis of the political and historical artifacts that make the Star Wars universe come alive. Politics, especially now, are highly divisive, and the social perception of them changes with the flow of time. However, some elements speak across multiple generations and draw from historical references. History without politics descends to mere literature. John Robert Seeley. Thousands of years before the Battle of Yavin, the Old Republic was one of the galaxy's largest political bodies. It operated as a democratic government and unifying force in the galaxy, whose hegemony was often unchallenged by outside authorities. The Republic is reminiscent of real-world democracies, such as the Republic of the United States, the early Republican Roman system, as well as the German Weimar Republic. The Clone Wars are a reflection of the Civil War in the United States. Both these conflicts had a league of secessionist confederates attempting to withdraw from a united republic, engendering the resulting wars. The Roman Republic, before its restructuring into an empire, was also forever changed by civil wars. The topic of slavery is also a political touchstone shared by the American Civil War and plays a prominent theme within Star Wars. The era of the first trilogy is filled with allusions to the Vietnam War, with its public unpopularity and morally gray quagmire of conflict with costly results. Similarly, Star Wars echoes the War on Terror with similar public sentiment and the erosion of individual liberties at the expense of granting the state increasing emergency powers. The Patriot Act and similar legislations did for the American executive branch what the emergency powers did for Senator Palpatine. 
the Republic suffers from internal corruption, largely by corporate interests surpassing public objectives. This political maneuvering by private lobbying has largely been criticized as a problem in American and Western democracies. George Lucas himself would confirm his political inspiration that were largely linked to the eras in which the sequel and prequel trilogies were made. A New Hope was released in 1977. The United States had just ended its role in Vietnam in 1975, and the cultural scars, returning veterans, and shift in cultural norms changed from conformity to rebellion in the United States from the 60s to the 70s left its mark on art. A young Lucas had just seen the ravages of an unpopular war and the fallout of an encroaching authoritarian government. Lucas had been called to service in the draft. However, he had been diagnosed with diabetes, which had exempted him from service. He had always been critical of the Vietnam War and had initially been slated to direct Apocalypse Now. His first foray into Star Wars was meant to illustrate America's drive towards, as Lucas put it, imperialism, and the rebels represented the desire for freedom and democracy. Lucas, at this time, had a self-ascribed rebellious streak. He later stated that his inspiration for Emperor Palpatine was Richard Nixon, and the scenes of Ewoks fighting the Imperials on Endor was also inspired by the Viet Cong and were the original inspiration for the Rebel Alliance. Ian McDiarmid, the actor who played Emperor Sheev Palpatine, has stated that he recalled Lucas telling him the design of the Emperor's throne room was based on President Nixon's Oval Office. In early drafts of Star Wars, the plot centered around a planet named Aquile and was meant to be more a direct representation of North Vietnam and the Empire was supposed to be a closer analogy to the United States 10 years from when the script was written. At a 1981 story conference, Lucas was asked if the Emperor was a Jedi, and Lucas responded with, quote, No, he was a politician. Richard M. Nixon was his name. He subverted the Senate and finally took over and became an Imperial guy, and he was really evil, but he pretended to be a really nice guy. It was really about the Vietnam War, and that was the period where Nixon was trying to run for a second term, which got me to thinking historically about how do democracies get turned into dictatorships? Because democracies aren't overthrown, they're given away. The clone troopers shared a penchant for air cavalry with the United States Army in Vietnam. The former used space-worthy transports, while the latter opted for Huey helicopters. Both militaries used their aerial transports to deploy quickly in otherwise impassable terrain. Like the original trilogy, the prequels were largely inspired by the political context in which Lucas wrote it. The Clone Wars period is modeled after America's invasion of Af Afghanistan and Iraq, coinciding with the cinematic releases of these movies. To draw further parallels, these wars have also been compared with the Vietnam War, both in conduct and popular opinion. Lucas also cited the Jacobin Revolution and Napoleon's rise to power as inspiration for democracies giving themselves a way to dictatorships often of their own volition and not necessarily as a violent or extreme takeover. Despite Lucas's critical view of modern Americana, he retained a reverent attitude to World War II. American history and wild Western romanticism, particularly in design to the rebels, some of the rebels' inspiration came from World War II Marines fighting in the Pacific against the Japanese Empire. Among other revolutionary groups, Lucas and his design team drew inspiration from countless guerrilla movements, including Princess Alea Oregana's iconic hairstyle, which was modeled after Mexican revolutionary Clara de la Rocha, along with native Hopi hairstyles. Lea, being a prominent female resistance leader, is also tied to the French resistance, 
particularly Marie Madeleine Foucault and the head of the Alliance, an underground intelligence network working with the United Kingdom and France. Other groups, such as resistance fighters on Ryloth and Onderon during the Clone Wars, also resemble the French resistance. Additionally, Saw Guerrera, a fringe rebel leader known for his extreme tendencies, was inspired by Che Guevara, the South American Marxist revolutionary, as well as elements of the Mujahideen and the Taliban were drawn in the Clone War operation to smuggle weapons, much like the American government in the Middle East fighting against the Soviet Union. In an amusing twist, during the Cold War, U.S. President Ronald Reagan proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative, which involved the pursuit of a means to neutralize the threat of enemy nuclear missiles, which involved exploring missile defenses, lasers, and orbital weapon systems. This initiative was contemptuously mocked with the nickname Star Wars by Democratic Senator Ted Kennedy after the films, and the project is sometimes still referred by that epithet today. Lucas also bases his mythos heavily on tropes of the American Old West, including the general lawless nature of the Outer Rim, the prevalence of bounty hunting, and general notions of Western-style freedom, as well as, in his words, quote, the Jedi are like marshals of the Old West, unquote. I love history, so while the psychological basis of Star Wars is mythological, the political and social basis are historical, quote by George Lucas. The Old Republic is rife with allusions to the Roman Republic, from architectural flourishes to the pseudo-Latin names of many chancellors and officials and pod racing similarities with chariot racing in the Circus Maximus. Senate guards originally had a Greco-Roman influence with plumed crested helmets and Corinthian-style faceplates. The key to the Roman Republic's inner workings was the Senate, a representative democracy which inspired American politics. The Galactic Senate, composed of representatives and senators from its member worlds, just as the American and Roman Senates are populated by representatives of areas within the Republic. There is a recurrent minor subplot within the Star Wars mythos that involves droid rebellions that mirror Spartacus and other slave revolts. It is plain that the basic structure of Lucas's history derives from the fall of the Roman Republic and the subsequent establishment of a monarchy. Tony Keene, from the book Star Wars and History. Within the Galactic Senate, the Chancellorship, the highest elected official of the Republic, Senate, and functioning head of government reflects that of the head of the Weimar Republic in Germany circa 1918 to 1933, wherein the Chancellor Adolf Hitler would also reorganize the Democratic Republic into a fascist dictatorship. Star Wars draws on thematic and aesthetic references from history that complement its narrative tone. Continuing with the 20th century German allegory, the Empire's visual and aesthetics parallel Nazi uniforms and color palette, particularly the officers, as well as more direct references to the Stormtrooper Corps as a politically militant wing of the Imperial regime. According to John Molo, the original costume designer for the original trilogy, he was directly inspired by World War I German cavalry units, as well as Prussian and Wehrmacht-style uniforms for the Imperial Officer Corps. While the original stormtroopers were a specialist World War I unit renowned for daring raids against enemy trenches, hence the moniker, their mythos was co-opted by the early Nazi party to represent political paramilitary forces known as the Stromboltig, a storm detachment. The stormtroopers of the Star Wars universe blend both versions of the stormtrooper to represent an elite and ideologically driven military branch known for radical offensives. Many imperial parades and unit formations, banners, color palettes, and memorabilia reflect Nazi propaganda. Ironically, the rebels have a moment during the award ceremony at the end of A New Hope that was inspired directly by Leni Riefenstahl's Nazi propaganda piece, Triumph of the Will. In the new canon, J.J. Abrams describes the creative process behind the First Order as inspired by a hypothetical sect of escaped Nazis in Argentina reconvening and reformulating a new threat. World War II aerial combat inspired the starfighter dogfighting elements, and the names of planets including Kessel, known for the infamous Kessel Run, being a German word for cauldron, 
but is used to refer to an encircling an enemy force, such as in a pincer movement, and is used as the term Kessel fever to describe the feelings of defeated hopelessness with no chance of escape by an encircled foe. Possibly a reference to the hopelessness or encirclement of the planet Kessel when smugglers attempt to evade authorities or the dangers inherent in the hyperlane within the new canon. The planet Hoth is named both after an ancient Jedi general and real-life German general, Hermann Hoth, whose, quote, Panzer Army unsuccessfully attempted to relieve Stalingrad during Operation Winter Storm. Hoth was involved in the Third Battle of Kharkov, the Battle of Kursk in the summer of 1943, and the Battle of Kiev. End quote. The Eastern Front was known for its inhosp- inhospitable cold weather, like the planet. The planet Tatooine is named after the Tunisian province of Tatooine, where the planet's desert scenes were filmed. The famed 501st Legion, a clone trooper turned stormtrooper corps, colloquially named Vader's Fist, are based off of the 501st Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division during World War II. These elite troops served by dropping into Normandy on D-Day and took part in Operation Market Garden and at the Battle of the Bulge. The 501st of Star Wars began as a cosplay community in 1997, initially for stormtroopers, that later was canonized into the Star Wars lore. The main thing is to make history and not write it. Quote, Otto von Bismarck. Japanese weapons and armor, along with the broader ideas of Japanese cinema, are reflected in certain aspects of the Jedi and Sith. Darth Vader's armor and helmet, along with its grotesque visage, are clearly inspired by the samurai warrior of feudal Japan and the general Sith armor often carries hallmarks of angular samurai armor. The nature and style of lightsaber combat is reminiscent of Kendo, as well as the folkloric tradition behind the katana, the samurai sword. Lucas adds mystical elements such as Arthurian ideas of Excalibur when describing lightsabers. Fight choreographers relied heavily on Kendo, among other martial arts, and stage fighting techniques when developing lightsaber techniques and combat. Another Japanese influence, Queen Padme Amidala's dress and makeup, is reminiscent of the traditional Japanese geisha. Most notably, her pale full face covering with red accents reflects a shiri-style foundation by geisha and kabuki actors in traditional Japanese performance. The Jedi closely resemble the social rules of samurai, follow a unique warrior code like Bushido, which ties spirituality and martial prowess along with the pursuit of peaceful activities. The influence of the Shaolin monks reflects the monastic side of the Jedi. The combat training and the iconic robes closely resemble those worn by the Shaolin order as well as traditional Japanese clothing. The concept of ki, or chi, an all-powerful life force that permeates everything, very clearly resembles the force. European knights also have a master-apprentice relationship through the tutelage system of pages and squires that train with and learn from senior Jedi in a one-on-one system of education. The Jedi and the purge during Order 66 is reminiscent of the French and Papal purges of the Knights Templar, another monastic order of warrior monks. The victims of government conspiracy between the French crown and the church, the Templar, like the Jedi, were ruthlessly purged and maligned by the states of which they were citizens. Additionally, The Inquisition played a role in the extinction of the Templar, and the Galactic Empire's Inquisitorius, clearly taking their name, the Inquisition, suppressed force users and seditious ideas. Mandalorians, a prominent cultural group that appear repeatedly within the Star Wars mythos, inspired by several historical warrior societies. The Mandalorian armor, particularly the helmet, is reminiscent of the Corinthian-style hoplite armor, including the T-shape of the mask. Cossacks, Mongols, Spartans all represent warrior traditions and training of youth to be soldiers, 
militarism, and combat. Two sources are most prominent in Mandalorian culture. The first being Maori warrior culture, including the actors portraying Jango and Boba Fett, Tamura Morrison and Daniel Logan, both being of Maori heritage, and most Mandalorian depictions and multimedia carrying over New Zealand accents, recent lore changes and ancestral Tong history notwithstanding. The traditional Mandalorian language, Mando-a, contains Peloponnesian flourishes, including the frequent use of apostrophes in its written form. Karen Travis, one of the principal developers of Mandalorian culture, again, prior to recent changes, cited Celtic culture as a primary source of inspiration. This is evident in the clan and family-based systems of the Mandalorians. Mongolians also share this clan-based system, as well as being largely seen as a foreign invading force against late medieval Europe much like the invasion of the Republic by the early Mandalorians, as well as the nomadic traditions that the Mandalorians and Mongols share. Mongols, like Mandalorians, basilisk war droids, were renowned horseback riders and used this to their advantage in military engagements. Mandalorians are often seen as savage and barbaric compared to the civilized Republic which mirrors Roman views of outside people, such as the Celts and savage barbarians. In the new canon, and with the new Mandalorian TV series, Dave Fillon has stated that he wanted to introduce Nordic elements into the Mandalorians. A significant event during the Mandalorian Wars of the Old Republic was the genocide of the Cathar race. This served as a flashpoint for the Revenkis to pursue an active military campaign against the Mandalorians. The Cathars of Europe were a Christian Gnostic sect who were hunted and purged to extinction by the Catholic Church in the 12 and 1300s. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Percy by Shelley, Ozymandias. The ancient Sith species are largely based on an Egyptian Mesoamerican Aztec society, including a penchant for pyramid building, monumental statues, and brutal sacrificial practices. Traditional Egyptian religion had strong emphasis on immortality and the afterlife, two driving psychological imperatives of the Sith. Additionally, from a European Romantic view, ancient Egypt had long been associated with mysticism and sorcery, Elements that pervade pop culture in such fictional works as Conan the Barbarian, Warhammer 40k, and the Mummy franchises. The Sith are no exception, and their manipulation of the Force is described as sorcerous. Ancient Sith clothing and adornments are also reminiscent of Mesoamerican and Egyptian jewelry, clothing, and headdresses. Give me liberty, or give me death. Patrick Henry Rebellion and resistance. Star Wars is built around the eternal struggle between liberty and authority. The rebellion and the resistance represent the willingness to take militant action against an ever-encroaching despotic government. Despite their framing, however, the line between freedom fighter and terrorist can blur very quickly. This line is often subject to the willingness of individuals or groups to mark certain targets as legitimate or off-limits. And as always, collateral damage is a side effect of conflict. Some elements of the rebellion, like those of Saw Gerrera, were known for their extreme viciousness and lack of regard for collateral damage when pursuing imperial targets. This led them to be ostracized by the mainline rebel forces. Centralized galactic governments would be hard to govern, 
as a republic or an empire. The scale of control needed to maintain social cohesion, economic viability, and enforce order are unprecedented and will lead to two kinds of extremes, inaction, corruption, and stalemate, the hallmarks of the republic, which operated akin to a loose formation of states or planets that was hampered by indecision due to its strict consensus-based processes. The Old Republic appears more analogous to the United Nations rather than the United States, with its Security Council veto power and control nested in powerful nations and interests that are able to flout consensus-based ordinances. The sheer differences in culture and government styles of individual member worlds were also hindrances in trying to create a cohesive, overarching government. There existed everything from feudal monarchies to democratic sub-republics to constitutional monarchies. This environment led to the flourishing of non-state actors like the Trade Federation and other corporate entities who became almost autonomous governing bodies that were even able to raise private militaries and buy politicians. A black market economy flourished that rose and fell in its influence based on how strong or weak the central authority was, such as when the Republic did or did not have a military or the will to use it. The Empire had a complicated but somewhat amicable relationship with the black market and was able to curb their excesses. There are elements of Lucas's view on American politics with his concerns of growing private interests, political corruption such as under the Nixon administration, as well as the complex and often self-undermining operations of the CIA and DEA in Central and South American affairs, particularly in regards to black market and narcotic affairs. The foreboding prospect of central authority, such as the empire, is the sheer amount of manpower and resources needed to maintain control would be astronomical, almost the price of a moon-sized battle station. Fear became a tool of control for the empire, leading to investment in superweapons as symbols of terror to prevent planets from breaking away. As Machiavelli warns, fear can be taken too far as to be cruel, and in so doing creates enemies from within which is exactly what the Empire did, and proved to be its own undoing. The Jedi, and their presence, as a theologically rigorous organization, with close ties to the government as enforcers, proved to be a destabilizing factor in the Republic. While it was helpful to use the Jedi as peacekeepers and police, questions of autonomy and planetary sovereignty would arise. The Jedi, and the suspicion they brought as political enforcers for the Republic, with no democratic responsibility, led to their own destruction, as they could easily be painted as potential usurpers. There are also a host of ethical questions raised in the religious genocide of the Sith. It seems liberty, in Star Wars, is a malleable concept. Despite the fluidity of governance between democracy and empire, there remains a number of personal liberties that create the atmospheric tone of the saga, which may or may not be intentionally interpreted as political positions. These, of course, refer to the romanticized wild western themes and individual autonomy of the inhabitants. Slavery and individual planetary governance notwithstanding, Weapons seem to be lightly regulated, and violent conflict with lethal outcomes seems to erupt often. This, of course, varies from planet to planet, with more civilized worlds having stricter policies on the outcomes of such encounters. Ships and transports are also seen to have a number of weapon systems, and this may just be a virtue of the need for defense in vast expanses of unregulated, and dangerous space and wildlife. This element of wild space implies that even during the dark times under imperial rule, they could not effectively control everything, and their reliance on regional rulers, moths, and planetary governors would also be the empire's undoing, for when its figurehead is slain, the tenuous hold over the galaxy crumbles, 
and leaves a series of broken fiefdoms in the imperial remnant. This has been seen time and again in history, such as the Macedonian Empire after Alexander the Great, the Khanates after Genghis Khan, Rome, and countless others. Economics is the art to meet unlimited needs with scarce resources. Lawrence J. Peter Star Wars does not exist in a post-scarcity world like the more optimistic science fiction property, Star Trek. Resources are limited, and therefore valued. The economy of the galaxy is scant in detail, but appears to be largely built on both free trade and enterprise, as well as slavery and central control. It changes based on what government is in control. Under the Republic, it is a laissez-faire system, and allows corporations such as the Techno Union, Trade Federation, and Zerka Corporation to become autonomous entities in the galaxy to the degree that they create private militaries and flaunt statist imposed regulations and laws. This changes when the Galactic Empire ascends to dominance and tends towards a centrally planned economy that nationalizes corporations and creates a central bank. Resource extraction is a big business in Star Wars, with mining and forestry operations often taking central roles in EU plots, as well as serving as a narrative backdrop for many planets and species. Artificial intelligence in Star Wars has not led to any kind of societal apotheosis, as post-humanists on Earth have predicted. Instead, AI is relegated to subservience to sentient biological creatures. There have been AI-led violent revolutions, as with the economy and government, no state utopia has been achieved in the galaxy, despite impressive technical achievements. Instead, Star Wars reinforces the hedonic treadmill as the regular trials and tribulations of galactic life regulate the overall social status quo and seem to lead to ever-repeating cycles of conflict, peace, love, and loss. Day-to-day -day struggles seem to be universal and relatable to audiences across generations. The black market plays a very important role in the galactic economy, regardless of whatever power is in ascendance. Illegal substances such as spice and human trafficking are major industries, particularly outside the galactic core, reinforcing the difficulty that even strong central authorities would have in governing such vast structures. Demand for the illicit has created a powerful system of crime lords who control borderline narco states. It has also had the opposite reaction of driving enforcement industries like bounty hunting and mercenary work, as piracy is also an ever-present threat and contribute to the economy of ill-gotten gains. Racism and race politics makes an appearance in Star Wars, but is less intraspecies and occurs more frequently as different alien and human groups exhibit different levels of xenophobia. From small personal tales of individuals struggling with bigoted beliefs, such as Anakin and the Tusken Raiders, to large-scale and sweeping acts of racial supremacy in the Empire or Yuzhong Vong. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. The war economy of Star Wars is modeled after the military-industrial complex of President Eisenhower's farewell address, and the topic is broached in universe a number of times. With a galaxy such as that of Star Wars, in a state of seemingly perpetual conflict, the establishment of a war economy is inevitable, and the manufacture of arms and ships is ripe for unscrupulous war profiteering and mercenary work. This is a reoccurring theme that illustrates modern questions of war economies. The overarching political narrative of Star Wars extols the virtues of liberal democracy and is often critical of corporatism, authoritarianism, and imperialism. Lucas and the innumerable creative minds that have contributed to the Star Wars narrative 
have drawn from history and real-world politics in order to build the mythos of the galaxy. Beyond it, all of the shifting milieu of modern politics has also morphed the values of the classical liberal, something Lucas may identify as, from left to right. Where Lucas would appear to be an anti-authoritarian leftist in the context of the 70s, the values of individualism and liberty have moved to the right libertarian. By the same token, the anti-imperialist, anti-corporatist sentiments resonate with a modern liberal audience. In this way, though Lucas himself may draw from real-world po political extremes, the universe comes off as reflective of the audience, somewhere in the middle. from history and Star Wars like what are some analogies to history that we see in uh, the Star Wars universe and how does that play out in the story maybe as kind of wish fulfillment for certain political perspectives um, I think one that I personally enjoy I really love ancient history um, I love the Rome analogies there with like conversion of a republic to an empire kind of like the uh, the crumbling corrupted republic is you know infiltrated by a um uh what's the word i'm looking for like a, a populist individual someone who's like very charismatic someone like julius caesar or like emperor palpatine who uh starts to take control and manipulate the system to their own benefit um, i found that really interesting and then just uh adding to that analogy to the roman empire as well as sort of especially when you can correct me on my history, but when uh, the Republic turned into an empire, right, when it went from its democracy to the autocracy, it um, was sort of at the height of uh, Rome's power and sophistication. Yeah, it was and, under and their, its imperial and their rule. wealth at that yeah. time, right? So kind of like the, how the galaxy is also, you know, super advanced, super wealthy. They've got all their stuff together in the material sense. And then... Uh, this existential crisis happens sort of because of the political machinations that are going on inside. And it's kind of a parallel to American society, especially in the seventies and the sixties, just coming out of like the fifties and sort of the economic boom that had just happened. So America is also in this time of prosperity when George Lucas is writing uh, star Wars as well and uh, kind of having those same fears that just like the Roman Empire as a republic was at its most wealthy and influential is when it became uh, a dictatorship uh, not quite an accurate analogy I kind of misunderstood what you said there okay. um, for Rome the Pax Romana is arguably I mean it depends right for Rome it, at the height of its power it was under its imperial system not an okay. Republican system. Gotcha. But what do we mean get, by power, though? Like the geographic spread of the yeah, they had the, the biggest colonies? territory, okay. had the biggest, most amount of wealth, and internal peace. There was like, little, like probably in, like even GDP or whatever. Was if you could measure it that yeah. way, yeah. And they also had like very little internal um, political unrest at that time. Um, so, but I the definitely the American reference is there, right? The often the 1960s are seen as like the, you know. U.S. is a, a political and economic powerhouse after World War II, and because uh, the whole landscape of Europe has changed, right? It used to be European powers were the uh, preeminent um, cultures, but at, in the 1960s, um, the Americans pretty much dominated the world, um, shy of you know the Soviet Union, and uh, and Lucas is writing from that perspective of like he he's very obviously very enamored of World War II. He's still like even in his work he put, puts a lot of references in. Um, in World War II imagery. So he's viewing that like exactly like you said, like that was the height and now we're kind of in this unstable nineteen mid nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies era when, you know, they're entering Vietnam and they're going to Korea and like the US starts meddling in, in world affairs more and more. Um he's very obviously anti um what's the word I'm looking interventionist. At least at this time. 
And, um, and like you said, like he, they're worried about what the future looks like for the U S you know, we've gone from this prosperous nation to, I should have said 1950s America is more like the uh, preeminent America, but yeah, they've gone from this industrious nation to a, um, you know, what, what's the future going to look like? This authoritarianism is taking over. Like, are we going to lose our personal liberties and, uh, like, where's it going to lead? Right. So that is an apt, apt comparison. Yeah, and it is like kind of in the backdrop of the two soup the, you know, the, the superpowers, uh, the eagle and the bear fighting each other, you know, the backdrop of the cold war and all that, um, sort of, uh, which goaded, you could arguably say goaded the U S to become more interventionist in, uh, it, during that time in order to fight the influence of Russia or the USSR rather over much of Asia and Europe. Yeah, but Lucas was on the other side of that political argument, right? He's arguing from the uh, anti-interventionist perspective. Yes, yes. Yeah, he, he is an anti-interventionist because it, it looks like the U.S. is turning into an empire because of yeah. their involvement. And in, that's where the concepts of like right. American imperialism and things like that are starting yeah. to develop. And so like even like he takes it, he takes that narrative approach all the way to like Ewoks being Viet Cong comparisons, right? Like he said this himself, which I don't think is a a quote that maybe is aged well, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah. And I think there's probably like a lot of worry that the U S was going to start declaring martial law and stuff like that. Yeah, And And, things were getting heated in the States. And that that is, that would be like when you, that's like when the president, the president could become a dictator, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, think, I think the, the cultural element there that that's probably the lightning rod around which a lot of the empire's character comes is is the draft, right? Like, yeah, yeah that's exactly. the. I mean, we don't really understand that now. There hasn't been a, another American draft. No, not no, since. has there? We're Canadian, in case <laughs> you don't know. So, yeah, there hasn't been. Yeah, there hasn't been a draft. But I mean, that's pretty crazy. Like, if you were a high school student, yeah. in in the U.S. in the '60s. Whenever the draft was at its height, you had a bunch of friends who were going gonna overseas. die yeah. in, in Vietnam, or, or get, you yourself, or you yourself. Yeah, maybe not die, but you know, get malaria and diarrhea and <laughs> do some heroin or something. <laughs> and Lucas himself was drafted too, right? Like he he got out of it, but he was. Um, but I, I think if that if that happened today, you would be very scared that your government is turning <laughs> into an authoritarian, into state. some kind of crazy authoritarian. Yeah, and not to mention like things like the uh, I forget what the massacre is called, where they shot the uh, university students too, right? Like things got to the degree. Yeah, that, sickened dogs on people. Yeah, and exactly. All that, became, all that stuff you see in music videos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, which actually leads to another interesting thought: is like a lot of, well, okay. Before I get into that. Um, there's also a lot of uh, parallels too with Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam. A lot of people like to compare the two as very similar unpopular wars. Yeah, like quagmires. Yeah, exactly. And wars fought against guerrilla forces Elements, as, yeah, as and, well. Which, and locally unpopular. And, as, as we've seen, is you basically can't fight a yeah. guerrilla army, right? Well, you can. You just I mean, do you it can. a certain way. Just but, poorly. <laughs> um, well, you forever. Can. Because you have <laughs> yeah. to fight an idea, right? It's not a... There's a whole there, there's textbook a whole thing. on insurgency fighting. We'll do but, a we'll do a yeah, podcast. It's called Scorch Scorch Sure that you you turn the place to glass, but that's not very good PR. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, in terms of the comparisons of the two, um, Bush also was getting a lot of uh, Bush Junior was getting a lot of um, comparisons made between him and Nixon, and you know with this war element. And the other interesting thing is the original trilogy was released with kind of just after during Vietnam. And then the uh, the prequel trilogy came out during the War on Terror. Yeah. So yeah. these kind of these big influences that Lucas himself has said um, yeah, were like probably, driving they're... forces behind those narratives and things like Geonosis, like the Desert World and stuff, like was definitely a very strong comparison. And that the whole uh, ascendancy of Palpatine, yeah, as well as like so totally obviously what he saw was going on with the executive branch in, in right, the exactly US at the, the, time, the implementation right? of again those emergency powers. Um, encroaching government passing of like strong arm legislation like the Patriot Act and things like that that were like eroding you know private citizens um, liberties essentially yeah. right and then also like in those movies the the influence of the Trade Federation could be seen as like um, I don't know like Halliburton or something you know like corporate corporate yeah. influence absolutely yeah, yeah. It's, it's, Star is a strong anti-corporatist uh, narrative yeah. that flows through it even in a lot of the EU things like the Zerka Corporation from the Kotor yeah, games yeah. Is, is seen as this like you know um, almost like the 
uh, East India Company and things like that. Where yeah. like or the Umbrella Company from uh, Umbrella, is it, is it Umbrella Corp from yeah. uh, Resident, Resident Evil? Evil. Resident yeah. Evil. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly right. Um, Who are sort of almost de facto arms of the government, basically. Yeah, yeah. or they have very special they- and close relationships. Well, the, this is just Resident Evil inside baseball, but doesn't like doesn't Umbrella kind of own the government? I honestly don't story. know about Resident remember. Evil, to be honest with you. Yeah. It, gets, it gets like very involved. No, but like the, no, but like the Hudson Bay Company or the right. East yeah. Empire Company, like they, they were, were arms they were of the government. They were companies, quote unquote, but they right. were just arms of yeah. the government, right? Yeah. Like they weren't really independent. Uh, yeah. who, whatever that, at whatever point they lost sort of that distinction of being like a private company yeah. right so but I, I think in star wars though like the rever- it, it's it's more the reverse right yeah. like which is more modern politics these are sort of especially with the trade union the fact that it's i mean they're they're run by the neomodians right but uh are they or is it just chaired the trade federation yeah, yeah it's run the, the nimodians yeah. but but it's basically it's with the robot empire right and so it's just that sort of like classic hippie uh fear-mongering kind of stance about industry and capitalism that is it's just this literally a faceless machine that's uh consuming yeah. all of our natural resources right. and, and whatever yeah, yeah. and they're never going to make moral choices they can't yeah. yeah and uh and yeah exactly and then they're because in, it's not in their programming right yeah and it's their increasing like influence on the the republic right yeah. they're the corrupting factor in the republic and that they're the ones that need to be stopped and eventually leads to the civil war of the clone wars you have all these private corporate interests on the uh on the confederate side against the republic which leads me to my next historical analysis of the obvious confederacy versus um <laughs> union <laughs> uh parallels of the civil war and the galactic clone wars which was essentially a civil war it was separatist states trying to secede from the union of the republic why did they separate <laughs> so <laughs> what we, we will actually get into what that was it the is actual, actually like, a very political what, in, in star wars yeah, yeah. I, I, I think this this would actually be a good time to bring it up it in, is in case you're uh blanking out as i am on this political so discussion. they don't touch on it super deeply in the movies um, and a lot of it is relying on the EU for kind of fleshing that conflict out. And it's actually very interesting because there are some very sympathetic cases to be made for the Confederacy. And Star Wars are very much painted with a single, they're the bad guy's brush. I think in like um, like the Clone Wars TV show and, yeah. and a lot of those stories. They start they, to make it a lot more gray. They do a lot of uh, like more nuanced Confederate yeah. uh, focused stuff. Yeah. And definitely how... And in the comic books as well. From what is it? From a certain point of view. A certain point of view. Yeah. From a certain point of view, it uh, very it very much looks like the Republic are the bad guys. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and there are some legitimate, very legitimate complaints that a lot of those um, separatists have uh, against the Republic. Um, there are some questions about like, okay, if you're the Trade Federation, for example, why are you divorcing yourself from the state that's potentially your own market? is a question I saw come up a lot, right? It's like if Walmart seceded to be its own country and tried to separate from the United States, it'd be mm-hmm. like, you're just going to war with your own market, which... Yeah, what, yeah. Were, what were they trying to do on Naboo, even? Um, well, uh, the thing about Naboo, too, it is interesting in a lot of... Um, and that's, that's like almost like our, our uh, Vietnam proxy again. It could... I, I almost wondered if, uh, like, the Gungans... Is that how you say it? Gungans? I think yeah. so. Uh, uh, if they were like um, more analogous to like Native Americans um, in terms of their like culture and stuff like that, and also like they they like didn't they're also like a very independent species where they didn't want to be involved. There is in. conflict, yeah, between them and the and the Nabu yeah, colonizers the, that yeah. are the humans, um, yeah. In, on their planet there's right. actually a lot of history and conflict between those two which we'll get to in our nabu episode eventually <laughs> oh, <God>. uh, <laughs> i can't wait <laughs> but uh but yeah there are some parallels there um for sure the uh yeah i i'm trying to stay away from getting into the star wars aspect of it um just because like that would be its own episode right like diving into the invasion of nabu why it happened there's a lot to do with like sidious's politicking uh palpatine's politicking he's strong arming the trade federation to do what he wants right right and you can see that like the the, the nimodians are actually like we don't really want to do this you yeah know, so is he, that legal he, he sort of had something on them uh yeah so that was obviously a big element in it so like even the, that corporation was being manipulated by behind the scenes individual um so their reasons for blockading naboo aren't necessarily 
in their own interests, in the Trade Federation's interest, uh, with that kind of background manipulation going on, per se. Yeah. So, like, uh, through all this, we can kind of see a lot of the parallels with Lucas's own, like, political philosophy and the, the narrative he wrote with Star Wars, that Star Wars wasn't just written in, like, a vacuum. Oh, no, absolutely yeah, not. And that's kind of what we're hitting a lot on this episode, too. And that is also interesting, too, because with the release of the new movies, um, and this is where we're going to get a little bit more divisive, I think, is a lot of people are upset with how politics is being used in the new Star Wars. And that isn't to say it's not ding- being done poorly. That's my opinion. But it um, it isn't true that Star Wars has been apolitical. It has never been apolitical. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and that some of that too has to do with like uh, questions of the death of the author and how how his politics are actually being implemented and how you as a, an audience member receives those politics um, in terms of death of the author and things like that. Like I, I don't say I necessarily agree with a lot of George Lucas's political beliefs, but the way he makes, he distills everything and simplifies it in Star Wars to mm-hmm. a level that, you know, I can identify. Yeah, like almost anybody can. It, it's sort of universal. The, right, exactly. Ways, yeah. So it's not, it's it, and those movies themselves are not as divisive. You can see very clearly, oh, the Jedi are the good guys. The yeah. Sith are the bad guys. The Empire is the bad side, you know. Which, which honestly is so, somewhat of a, it works great in fiction, but it works terrible in real life. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like yeah. People always need to separate real life politics yeah. from <laughs> fantasy, right? And yeah. I think that's one of the problems you can't, of the new you can't, movies. Yeah, you can't just paint like your enemy With as a, a dark brush. lord of the Sith. Exactly. Right. <laughs> to bring this discussion back to Star Wars... It was one of the best lines in Star Wars, I think, is um, I can't remember exactly what Anakin says, but it's when Anakin and Obi-Wan are having that duel and Anakin says something and then Obi-Wan's reply is only a Sith deals in absolutes. Right. Right. It's like there's there's always nuance. Nobody's ever Hitler had dogs (laughs) who he loved and he was a vegetarian. Right. (laughs) All all that kind of stuff. It's like, (laughs) yeah, or like painting Nixon as like, you know an evil Sith Lord. And again, I'm not necessarily a Nixon fan myself by any stretch of the imagination. He had kids and they probably loved him and yeah, but he loved them. And even beyond that, even on policy issues, things are way more complex when you're dealing with other countries, other groups of people, other interests. There's so many variables and considerations. Unless you're doing a one for one narrative. Yeah. You you can't really, you know, and, and that's one thing that I like about Star Wars is that they don't try to make that. You probably didn't know that the Ewoks were supposed to be the Viet Cong just by looking at them. There's some parallels, there, but it's not like they're straight up. But also like you referenced what you didn't say before, but like, uh, Nixon is like a parallel or did we say that earlier in the episode? I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Nixon is like a parallel to Palpatine. Palpatine yeah. Right. And yeah, the Viet Cong or the Ewoks. And that's where he got the idea for the jowls. <laughs> <laughs> no, the emperor's character. It all makes sense. Yeah. It all <laughs> comes Nixon, together. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but even like the stormtroopers are now yeah, like two literal star to, term, stormtroopers. Yeah. And yeah. there's, there's lots of, and the interesting and thing. And they're white, like, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> well, actually that has more to do with them. Um, I was reading on the designer of the costumes. We're going to do a design episode of Star Wars, <laughs> but that has to do more with the uh, conceptions of death. If you look at the star, oh, really? helmet, oh, okay. it looks like a skull. Yeah. It's I, I skull. always, I, yeah. maybe that's a misconception. I always imagined that it was more like, almost like a purity thing like uh you could maybe read some kind of nazi elements into it yeah um, there's something of that in there but then like you see other nazi elements that the empire does incorporate like their officers uniforms and stuff again where I'm nazi actually, fashion is the color white hold on hold on hold on <laughs> yeah. actually that is not true again oh did reading, you discover that reading from the design notes, oh they're like prussian World they're more War like prussian World oh, War yeah, one yeah, 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 uniforms yeah. but i do agree that their general aesthetic is is reminiscent of Nazis, right? Yeah, the but I mean, banners, where did the Nazis the big... get their aesthetics from? It was from the Prussians. No, actually, well, yes, but you know who designed Nazi uniforms? is Hugo Boss. I, I did know that, yeah. yeah. Hugo Boss. Oh, yeah. oh really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and incredible. Coco Chanel was a Nazi sympathizer in France. So so, well, so was like Gerald actually, Ford. Basically. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. in the U.S. He was yeah, he, a, I mean, Gerald all, Ford. Like, pretty much all the big... Uh, German companies, whatever they do, <laughs> did something terrible in World like War II. Vol- Volkswagen, <laughs> yeah, Volkswagen, yeah. Volkswagen and and probably built later. all their yeah. like uh, armored vehicles. BMW too. I think. Actually, I have no idea, but <laughs> no, you're one hundred percent right. I mean, and actually, Mitsubishi- the Volkswagen was literally Hitler's idea. 
Yeah. The, the oh, Volkswagen that's what it's called. Be the Volkswagen. Be the people's car. Oh, I yeah, see, I that see. was yeah, the yeah, brain. Yeah. Child, one of his brain children. The other interesting thing too is the Mitsubishi uh, company yeah. designed the Zero, the Japanese Zero fighter. Oh, airplane. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. That they used to bomb Pearl Harbor and you know. And BMW the made like all the airplane uh, engines. And really? Stuff, I, I think. Yeah. I believe they did. I think they do that. Someone now can fact check too. Fa- fact check us. Hit us back those. with an email. And, uh, yeah. If any, if there's any like historian, <laughs> World War II historians or Vietnam War historians. Yeah. And IBM also made uh, the. Did they do ICBMs? No, IBM actually it was a primitive computer that the Nazis used. Oh, it was really? it was a data punch card thing that had your uh, racial background on it. <laughs> so this was how they um, organized people, obviously by race in order to later on down the line be uh, rounded up and put into extermination camps. Really? I didn't know that. And it was IBM punch card machines that did that. Wow. A lot of them. It was a big contract for them. So are droids in Star Wars a reference to? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> um, but anyways, kind of to get back on track here. Yeah, there, there's a, like obviously a ton of historical references. Even we've just been like spitballing. They just keep coming out, right? Um. But yeah, I was. I just wanted to go back to like in the in the new canon, the new lore. A lot of uh, criticism is leveled at the new series for inserting politics into their. Yeah, it's not really inserting it when it's like always been there. It's <laughs> yes and no. Um, I think the way that it's done is the important distinguisher here. It does feel like it it's feels very heavy-handed. Yeah, it feels heavy-handed. It feels like. Disney made some very specific choices to appeal to the widest possible demographic. That that is a huge part of it. Is my suspicion. I think that's like, yeah, it's like a, a profit thing. Ninety nine point nine percent of it. But the irony of that is that it's actually not working. Yes, that is the supreme. <laughs> it's irony. backfiring. That that shows you that like no matter what, you just can't really industrialize the uh, artistic process. I guess. <laughs> is that your a lesson learned from? That's this? my lesson learned. Yeah. Um, and one thing that because I mean the first ones as we were talking about they were ham handed too but it but I it worked <laughs> and you didn't I, really I, care again I I don't think that's entirely true because yeah. because um that's the dividing line I kind of want to draw between the old prequels and the old original trilogy and these new ones is that they're not one for one representations they're not um, like if those parallels are there they're they're distinct enough that Sidious is his own character. You, you don't see, oh, that's literally Nixon, right? Yeah, like like the Empire could right, be yeah. analogous to Rome, Genghis Khan, Alexander yeah. the Great. It could be analogous, like, it does... It, and it's the general notions yeah, of imperialism yeah, yeah. that he's attacking, right? Not like, this is America in, yeah, the, yeah. in, the, in the Vietnam War, right? Yeah, yeah. He's not, it's not that explicit. I Even though people saying. maybe would have thought that, but it's still, it's, it's, broad, it's, it's broad enough, I think, that <clears throat> you could say make multiple uh, comparisons yeah, yeah comparisons, exactly yeah. and so and and then again it, there's only like one one conclusion you can draw from the disney stuff yes exactly it's very and at times i would say many times yes yeah and and a lot of it has to do with like you said i think marketing a lot of behind the scenes production um there have been some statements that have been concerning by a lot of the showrunners like um one of the writers for Rogue One and for like J.J. Abrams and Kathleen Kennedy have made their political opinions very apparent, even in the process. Um, like half the stuff you know about Star Wars is after the fact. Right. right, right. Lucas's interviews after the fact or, you know, um, comparisons he made after the design process. But this is very upfront, very political, a lot of it doing with like identity politics and things like that. And I think that's just the general milieu of Hollywood right now, too, that obviously Star Wars is not immune from. But it's also having a uh, a negative impact on the franchises that choose to adopt those things. Um, one thing that I and I find like personally repulsive is the attack on fans specifically. Yeah. Um, so instead of like recognizing their own missteps, they turn it into an attack on on people who enjoy the content and things, and that again further destroys their own. It audience. like alienates a lot of people. Right. Exactly. It, yeah. It, it there is this thing that's like ha- it happens a lot with like the Marvel Cinematic Universe too, where if you criticize something or if like a group of people just say, hey, like this, I, it's like you have to be immune from criticism yeah, or, or else you're, you get thrown like a number of different labels, which is kind of like, kind of not a great thing to do to your own fan base, especially your most loyal fan base. Like the people who actually are that invested in it, you yeah, know, they might start a podcast. About it. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a backlash yes <laughs> terrible um and another thing in terms of the politics and things i just wanted to dive in a little bit with the uh the politics of feminism surrounding a lot of the new stuff because that is one of the big pushes um and i like i, I completely resent their their ignoring of all the previous like lead characters like princess leia was very much a um a feminist icon even for the time that the original trilogy came out yeah and you know there are character there are tons of female characters in star wars characters that i even personally disliked when i first were introduced them like ahsoka tano i hated that character when she was first uh <laughs> does introduced it, does it pass the bechdel test though the Bechdel test is not a good indicator. But does it pass it? Does it pass <laughs> that's it, exact, this is exactly does it pass the, it? That's exactly the problem, is this heavy-handed, like... So explain the Bechdel yes and, test. For the Bechdel test is if your, um, whatever thing you've written, your your movie script Arts. or your, your, okay, your, art, your yeah. book, whatever, if does it have two females that are just talking to each other about something other than a man? Yeah. Oh, okay. there's, if, a, there's a couple of qualifiers just like how many female characters yeah. in total are there at any point in in, in the your story, story. Yeah, and, right, right. and it turns out that if you analyze a lot of right a lot yeah m- most things written before like 1969 i sure. think probably. even most things today but again even, the bechdel test still. is a very poor indicator I, I hate that people have adopted it as this like standard because it's why? really it's without, sort of arbitrary yeah why is that arbitrary i'm gonna uh, I'm gonna have to start a whole other episode on this um, if you really want to go into. <laughs> I it. do want to go into it. Okay. Well, well, we'll record an episode because after this. what I love about it, about that Bechdel test, is yeah. it gives you a way to put a numerical value to something like art. No, it makes you yeah. by the racism <laughs> or, or sexism. Or no, but that's right? a, that's the problem. It, is, it allows you to put an empirical measure on it on no, ideas. But the, the, but the problem is it paints. Ideas? The problem is it paints something that it like. You could you could misinterpret. It's like something that's very easy to misinterpret the data if you were to just yeah, especially if you it. have a pre existing um, agenda, right? Again, like people, you can't just assume that because something failed the Bechdel test, it is racist or sexist or whatever the case. No, may but be. we we can't assume that it's it's not portraying. Exactly. I have bad Strong, news independent female characters. This podcast is uh, failing the Bechdel yeah. test right now. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't say that you have to abide pass, by it. pass the Bechdel. I think it is interesting, especially if you're a sociologist or something, that right. you can analyze. But I think it's if, you're, definitely, if you're practicing science, you should use um, tools that are accurate. Yeah, but the Bechdel, something like the Bechdel test it is, is trying to get at a way to do that. Sure, maybe it's a start, but it's such a rough... It is. It, it is. Inter- it's like interesting. I'm. I, it's not. I'm not saying it's not invaluable to know to have something like that. It's an interesting like thought experiment. But I. I don't think that. It, it's. It, it's weird to pigeonhole things into like a story. Let me using. That. Let me put it this way, and this yeah. will be my final point on the on the Bechdel test. So, what is the the gender distribution of humans in the world? In the world, it's like roughly fifty. It's 50. roughly fifty yeah. fifty. Yeah. So that being the case, wouldn't you then expect to see that borne out? Like that characters are 50 50 represented. You think this podcast would be 50 50 represented, Sam? No, that is, no, that's absolutely not if true. You, if you it generalize ignores, it, it ignores, <laughs> but that's exactly the problem. It ignores nuance, it ignores the details of why things are the way they are, right? Like I said, like what explains a podcast about three males talking about Star Wars versus three females? Or not to say that those couldn't exist, but be it sociological reasons, be it biological reasons, males tend to like Star Wars. Males tend to be nerds, things like that. And that's actually behind yeah. the Disney marketing ploy is to get more females, females no, into the, Star the, Wars. The, the problem with that methodology too is you can't expect an equal distribution of anything. That That's a ridiculous way. To, it's not a good premise. It, to start yeah, it's, not, it's a bad premise because that doesn't exist anywhere in nature where there's some kind of equal distribution Wait a minute. Of, of something. What did we just say about humans though? And our distribution sure. of... Yeah, isn't that an d- even distribution? I, d- even, di- but in terms of production or producing something, there's no like even distribution of anything like why are there more female like 90, nurses? why are there more female teachers why are there more you know yeah. why are there more male garbage men why yeah, are there more you're male never soldiers? gonna like in terms of actual outcomes right like that humans make with their hands like it, it's just i don't know it, it's sort of even like skill and talent right yeah like you know why aren't there x number of people well maybe x number of this group doesn't you know is not interested in that path or is not interested right um it can be 
taken to an economic context. It's like there's so many variables that using one arbitrary test with very poor metrics is not going to give you, it's not going to say much, right? It can give you, like you said, a number, but what does that number actually mean? But, 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 and, but even like, I'm not saying that we shouldn't like, there shouldn't be female represent. Obviously, if they want to reach a female audience, they should have female representation. Like, in say something like Star Wars, but that's not to say like all movies should be like I know uh, like Ford versus Ferrari, for instance. That movies come under criticism for not having female representation, right? But it's like there's no female <laughs> yeah, that, that story, yeah, that, right. it was yeah. In it's Italy in the sixties. It, it's <laughs> right. it's oh, accurately totally the problem is is accurately representing what actually happened, right? Like. But and then when you get into fiction, yes, there's yeah. arguments of like, well, why can't we change that? And of course, you can. Yeah, you c- absolutely. And no one's arguing against that. I'm not against it. Necessarily. I think it. But again, it's this arbitrary factor, right? Like I said, there are plenty of of strong female characters that have been ignored or disparaged even by the new canon. Like even Padme, who's this like politi- yeah. political figure, totally. has a lot of action scenes, right? For someone who you assume is just a politician, yeah. and characters like her are completely ignored or mocked or looked down on again princess leia who in the you know back in the 70s even was like a forward and again the whole era of movies is often criticized as like hyper masculine testosterone driven era of like schwarzenegger and action movies but you had lots of strong female characters from that time too alan um ellen ripley right from the alien series um uh the terminator right yeah um uh, again, Whatever her name it's, was. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's more I'm upset with the historical revisionism. Sarah Connor. Sarah, Sarah Connor. Connor yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what, yeah. what revisionism? What do you mean? Like this, this trying to paint like, well, Star Wars needs to change from oh, what? I see. Right. And so they paint it as if those characters never existed, um, and try to force this uh, new version onto people. Right. This new interpretation of the past, and that's what I have a problem with. It, it, and some th- it does come off a little on the nose as tokenism, you know. It, it's, and, and that's where the marketing side of it yeah, comes in, right? It's yeah. like, oh, okay, we want to appeal to it, females. It's like they're, it's just, they're not actually writing good characters. They're just writing female, female or ca- male characters. Right, exactly. And, and, that's, they, and they're just, what they're doing is they're flipping the stereotypes and making the female powerful and the male weak, right? And then Or submissive. Or, yes. Yeah, yeah, or submissive or, or sort of clunky. Which you can write whatever story you want, but it's I think it's a fair it, critique to say it's like poor storytelling. Yeah, it's like poor storytelling to do that. Yeah, and right? then that's the other thing too with this is that um, as poor as like writing things the day you're shooting them, which is <laughs> what what George Lucas did in the first trilogy. And, I believe but again, that's exactly fair. It's fair to criticize, it is fair to the, criticize old, yeah. <laughs> the old Star Wars movies, the prequels for their flaws. So why can't we criticize yeah, the yeah. new ones for their flaws, right? Yeah, like Jar 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 Binks was a bad character, <laughs> bad choice. <laughs> he he Dis- just was not disagree. good. Yeah. Hard to disagree. <laughs> I felt really seen. When I saw Jar Jar Binks. You feel represented. I felt represented. <laughs> Finally, there's a googly-eyed, wet, um, gangly, gangly, hardly able to understand. Um, probably can change his sex if he gets exposed to certain pollutants in the environment, just like. You know, because he's because he's an amphibian. Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing. That. I don't know if that's true of Gungan specifically, <laughs> but because uh, I can possible, change I my sense <laughs> according to environmental Factors. pollutants. Yeah. Um. Excellent. Fun facts. <laughs> Fun facts. Uh. Finally, uh, just kind of wrap this up. Um. Kind of tied to what we were just talking about, but Lucas himself has been quoted as saying, uh, "Star Wars is for twelve-year-olds," and there is some truth to that, right? Like. Um, I feel he felt unjustified in a lot of the criticisms being fired at him for the prequel trilogy specifically because in his mind, he's writing a movie for kids. Right. Um, But with everything we've just talked about in terms of like politics and like actual deep ideas involved, not to say that children, I I think children's um, art directed at art directed at children has suffered a lot. I mean, if you go back to like a lot of the classics, like even things like Lord of the Rings and C.S. Lewis's um, work, like the Chronicles of Narnia. The Chronicles of Narnia, amongst other things. Like, a lot of it is very dense and very in-depth. And C.S. Lewis had a very underrated space opera. Uh, the What was it called? Do you I remember? don't remember. The, 
Paralandra is uh, one. That's one of the books. Is, is I don't remember what one. the. I can't the remember what the trilogy, called, but yeah. it's, it's worth a read. It's very strange, like fifties sci-fi, sci-fi stuff. Yeah, and uh, but like think how de- dense a lot of that material is, right? And that was aimed at kids as well. Um, and I just wanted to kind of touch on like this, the same kind of attitude of like and the full of nudity. Yeah, C.S. Lewis was a pervert. Yeah, they're naked the entire uh, book in Paralandra. Yeah. Well, I haven't read it. So. <laughs> I think that's because it was supposed to be a reference to Adam and Eve. It, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Garden of Eden type yeah. situation. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. continue. We won't get too sidetracked here. Yeah, but just I just wanted to kind of bring that up because that's a, another major. Obviously, the, the big battlegrounds is like everyone, to some extent, likes the original trilogy. Huge battlegrounds are the prequel trilogy when they came out. You have the fans that, you know, Star Wars is ruined forever. And, yeah. you know, other ones who grew up with it. And we were the 12-year-olds at the time that it yeah, came yeah. out that it was aimed at. So maybe there's an element of that where, like, we're more lenient towards it. Yeah. Because we were the target demographic. And maybe, just maybe, with these new ones, as much as I personally dislike them, um, they're aimed, you know, again, at a new audience, right? And if in the future things may change, in terms of opinion of things. But uh, I would also just say, though, a caveat is, like, it's... I don't think it's all, like, Rogue One was a, a very good story. Um, yeah, The Mandalorian is very popular, which yeah. is airing currently while we're recording this. Yeah, <laughs> like, they're... Yeah, they're... It's not like Disney's just... All, we all th- Yeah, we're thinking they're putting out all... And it's not like you can't like it. If you like it, like, by all means, like it. And if you have, like... Uh, yeah, I would say if anyone wants to critique our position, at least have like a good argument. <laughs> Don't just you know yeah. th- hurl some sort of label or something, because like we're trying to like cri- critique it in good faith and not just be well. It it has to be this way because we like it a certain way, right? right? And and on that note too, just with the prequels, like I want to say I enjoy those movies, but I recognize at least two of them are not good movies, right? <laughs> and I can say that as a fan of, yeah, those, yeah. of those movies, right? I like the universe. I like a lot of the expanded universe around them. But I cannot also say, you know, I like what I like, and I know, I can objectively say, I know they're not quality, <laughs> quality. pieces, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. But, and then, like, can you say the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, anyways, just to wrap it up, um, let us know what you guys think. Like, do you agree with that analysis? Do you strongly disagree? Do you think we're being unfair? Uh, let us know. Uh, we're definitely open to hearing arguments, good faith arguments, you know. Uh, if people are just going to name call or, or hurl mud, we probably will, will ignore it. But, um, yeah, uh, definitely reach out to us. and uh, We'd like to know what you think. Yeah, just... Uh, join in the conversation on that. You are listening to the so, Star on that Podcast. note, uh, we'll wrap it up, boys. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Are you stuck up, half witted, scruffy looking nerf herder? But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to give the show a five-star rating and review, and give us a follow on social media. This episode was produced and edited by me, Jordan Swaim, written and directed by Christian Lutz and Sam Swaim. All original music was scored and recorded by my music project, Farewell to Shadowland.